Hey guys, Mr. Flanagan here, checking in with you about the loanable funds market, which we'll get to in just a minute. Before we get to that graph, a couple of notes on terminology. I'm not going to just read all this to you, so if you want to just take a pause and read it, you can. Otherwise, the two major things we want to focus on are the terms deficit and surplus. So a deficit is when the federal government in a one-year period spends more than it collects in taxes. Taxes are essentially income for the federal government. So this is where spending is greater than income, but now we're looking at the federal government. So it's always a bummer when I update this because last year, just in the year 2017, because again, it's a one-year period where taxes are less than government spending, the federal government spent $665 billion more than it collected in taxes and other forms of income. A surplus, pretty straightforward, is just the opposite, where there was more income than spending. The last time we had that was 17 years ago, where we had a budget surplus. The national debt is where we add up all of our country's years of deficit and surplus, and we look at are we overall in a positive or negative. Uh, now, we call it national debt, so clearly we are in the negative. The United States, if you can see it, I don't think anything's blocking it down at the bottom. The United States, from founding to present, has operated at a total of a $21 trillion debt. So adding all of our deficits together, adding all of our surpluses in there, we have essentially spent $21 trillion, about $21.1 trillion, more than we have collected in income over our nation's history. Yikes. So we're going to look at one way of how that happened and why did it actually happen or why does a deficit happen in some years. One reason why is because we have something called deficit spending. Our major topic for the loanable funds market is crowding out, and we'll get to that in just a minute. However, deficit spending is essentially when the government has determined it needs to spend more money than it has in income, so it's going to go out and borrow money in order to keep spending. Now you think, well, why would the government want to spend more money than it's collecting in taxes? Well, when the government is either at a, excuse me, when the economy is either at a recession or depression where we are below or very far below full employment, the federal government often will say, well, in order to kickstart, boost up our economy, we are going to increase our own spending. We'll build bridges, infrastructure, public works projects, whatever it might be. As long as we get people back to work, we can hand out money, not hand out, but pay people for those jobs which will then multiply out through the economy, which will at least help, if not solve, the recession or depression. Now that has a bit of an unintended side effect. We know it happens, it's not a surprise, um, but it does limit the positive effect of government spending. So essentially you're thinking, well, why wouldn't the government just raise taxes so it could collect money and pay for the spending that way? Well, if we're at a recession or at a depression, if you increase taxes, that's going to hurt the people, the consumers, even more, which is going to put us further into a recession or depression. So that's not a good idea. So the federal government says, we are going to deficit spend or borrow money in order to finance our spending rather than increasing taxes. So this is where our major graph number four comes in, the loanable funds market. Loanable, pretty straightforward, loaning. Funds, meaning money. Market, meaning graph. And this is what it looks like. On the y-axis, we label it real interest rates. Again, interest rates being the price of getting a loan. So you can think about this just like all of our other graphs, almost like the price axis, because if you go to get a $1,000 loan from a bank, the bank's not just gonna say, hey, cool, here's $1,000, pay us back exactly $1,000 next year. No, the bank is gonna say, pay us back $1,000 plus interest. That is the price of borrowing money. The, y, or the x-axis down here, I don't want to put the mouse all the way down or the cursor just because then an annoying little icon pops up. Down at the bottom right of your screen, you see quantity of loanable funds. So again, this is really just labeling it as price and quantity down at the right. We can abbreviate it QLF and we can abbreviate the y-axis as RIR, real interest rates. Now you see it's another X shape and it has a supply and a demand. Most of the graphs that we look at, other than the PPC, are essentially supply and demand graphs, and this is nothing different. The supply of loanable funds 
Think about that as savers. When banks loan money, they actually take money out of people's accounts, like our bank accounts, and loan money out to other people or businesses. It's kind of weird. We'll get to it next unit. But basically, if you deposit $1,000 into the bank, the bank is legally required to keep about $100 of your money sort of on-premises in the vault. The other $900 that you put in, they are legally allowed to loan out to other people and charge those other people interest and make money off of your money without actually giving you any of that interest or that money that they are earning or a very, 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 very small sliver of that interest uh, they give to you. So that is the supply of loanable funds. If people put money into savings accounts, the supply of loanable funds increases because when there's more money in the bank, banks can loan it out. If people take money out of their savings account, the supply of loanable funds would decrease or shift to the left because there's less money available for banks to loan out. The demand curve, the downward sloping demand curve, uh, we can abbreviate that DLF. You can just abbreviate LF for loanable funds. You don't have to write it out every time. The demand for loanable funds comes from borrowers. That could be the public, people wanting to make big ticket purchases that they need to get loans for. It could come from businesses, the I component of GDP, where businesses want to invest in capital goods or machinery or new land or factory, something like that. But our focus is really going to be on the government. Remember, if we are at a recession, the government determines, well, we need to spend more money to help solve this economic crisis. So the government actually comes in and demands loans. So again, the government could also be a borrower. And this slide right here is just breaking down what I just said. So if you want to pause and kind of uh, scroll back a little bit and read and reapply that, you can. Again, the demand for loanable funds is where we're going to see government spending or that deficit spending, as it can be called. So again, our major concept for this graph is called crowding out. So the idea sort of conceptually is that if our economy is in a recession, again, federal government is going to spend money, increase its own spending to get people back to work and kickstart the economy, get more money circulating out there. However, the government can't raise taxes to help pay for that spending. So the government, they or the federal government are going to borrow money. That is the deficit spending, borrowing money and then spending it in order to help the economy. So what's going to end up happening is the federal government is going to increase the demand for loanable funds. And we'll see what happens on our graph uh, right here. So it shows that real interest rates will increase. And if interest rates go up, you and me and businesses don't want to get loans because again, interest rates are the prices of borrowing money or interest rate is the price of borrowing money. So if the price of getting a loan goes up, you and I don't want to pay that higher price. So we stop getting loans and we stop investing if we're a business. So we'll get to that and show that graphically right about now. So again, we're starting here, ADAS, aggregate demand and supply at recession. We are below full employment. The federal government determines, hey, we're going to do something about it. We want to shift AD to the right and bring us back to long run equilibrium. Sounds like a good idea. But again, during a recession, the federal government's not going to raise taxes. They want to increase spending by borrowing money. So the federal government is going to go into this loanable funds market, which right now is just at standard old equilibrium. Now, the federal government is going to demand loanable funds, going to demand loans, because again, the federal government is wanting to borrow more money or borrow money to pay for its own spending. So the demand for loanable funds is going to increase. Now, when we shift, again, any curve, any graph, always an increase shifts to the right, a decrease to the left. So the government came in and increased demand for loanable funds to pay for its deficit spending. So we shift the demand curve to the right. We relabel our equilibrium. We have quantity of loanable funds too, and real interest rate too. Now here's the problem. Real interest rates went from here, they increased up to here. So what that means is real interest rates increased, meaning it is now after the government went and got these loans, more expensive 
for consumers and businesses to actually go in and get loans. So the government's idea was this. If we are all the way back here at recession, federal government says, cool, we're going to jump into this loanable funds market. We're the big, bad, strong federal government. We're going to push everybody out of the line, go right to the front of the line and say, hey, we need to deficit spend. We need to get loanable funds so we can get this economy back on track. We demand loanable funds. Loans, lots and lots and lots of loans are given to the federal government, which leads to an increase in real interest rate. Now, the immediate effect is this. AD does increase, it shifts to the right because of the G component of aggregate demand, G component of GDP increasing, which helps shift us out of this recession back to or back towards, I should say, long run equilibrium. That would be the goal of this part of fiscal policy. Again, fiscal policy, the government changing its spending or taxing to solve an economic problem. However, it doesn't just stop there. The federal government went and got so many loans that, well, now the real interest rate increased. So what that means is there's this chain reaction effect. So I'm not going to keep saying it. We were at a recession. Government solution was, let, was let's increase our spending, also known as deficit spending. We saw on the graphs that that means there's an increase in the demand for loanable funds, which when we shift demand for loanable funds to the right, there is an increase in real interest rate. Now, what that will eventually lead to after the government went and got that loan and spent the money is when those interest rates are higher as a result of the deficit spending, consumers like you and me and businesses are not going to want to go out and get loans because the interest rate, the price of getting that loan is too high. So if consumption and investment decrease a little bit because fewer people are going to get loans, then that eventually means that AD in the bottom left will decrease a little bit as well. That's the idea of crowding out. The federal government went in and borrowed so much money that real interest rates increased. That crowds out individuals like you and me and businesses. We do not want to get those loans anymore. So aggregate demand actually backslides a little bit because you and me, the people and businesses were crowded out by the big, large federal government. So eventually AD will decrease which if we graph that out on our ADAS graph, eventually price level will drop a little bit, real GDP will drop a little bit, which means unemployment will also increase by a little bit. But now here, sometimes I get the question that says, wait a second, you always said that government spending increases AD, and then you showed us that on the graph, but now at the bottom of the chain reaction, you're telling us that AD decreases again? Like, is that a mistake? Or that seems kind of weird. Well, here's the idea. You can read this here. I'm just going to kind of abbreviate it. The government spending has a huge immediate impact, a positive impact on GDP. It multiplies out. The goal is that basically the federal government, their spending will have such a tremendous positive impact that crowding out the amount of money that is crowded out for C and I is actually much less than the overall positive effect um, of the government spending. So again, basically, in terms of big picture, yes, you and I in businesses, the C and I components do decrease a little bit because we got crowded out. But overall, there is still a sort of net positive, just a tremendous positive impact because of that substantial amount of government spending. So that's the idea of crowding out. If you want to go back um, and take a look at that other video on the post on Google Classroom, I would recommend that as well. This is just a note on shifting the supply of loanable funds. It is possible that you will be asked about this. Most frequently, it would happen on an FRQ. And just like everything else, just trust your ability to shift and relabel, and then just trust what those labels told you. So for example, if we started here, just at equilibrium in the loanable funds market. And let's say we have a scenario that says uh, people in the US are afraid 
that a recession or some trouble is coming, so they increase their savings. Well, if people increase their savings, that means there's more money in the bank. If there's more money in the bank, then banks can loan out that money to other people. And again, we would have an increase in the supply of loanable funds. So we would show a rightward shift, an increase in the supply of loanable funds. And the impact that that has on our economy is that real interest rates decrease. Now, that's overall a pretty good thing because if real interest rates decrease, that means it's cheaper for businesses and individuals to go out and get loans. So especially if businesses are going out and getting loans, they are going to invest in their own business, a uh, new factory, new tool, new research, new land to develop something. So if the supply of loanable funds increases and we see a decrease over here in real interest rate, that's going to increase consumption and investment, which again will shift AD to the right. And because businesses are investing, that will actually lead to long-term or long-run economic growth. Because when businesses go get these cheaper loans, they're going to invest in capital goods and machinery, not just more like raw materials or raw ingredients. So by investing in land, property, machinery, technology, they will also be increasing eventually um, the long-run productive capabilities of an economy. So I encourage you, again, I've said it third time now, check out this video that is posted, I believe it's video 4.14. And then there's another one below it that shows that connection between ADAS and the loanable funds market. Watch those two and you should be good to go for any multiple choice questions on crowding out and then any FRQs on the loanable funds graph. So if you have any questions, as always, feel free to email me, tweet, whatever, come and see me before class. Otherwise, we'll see you next time.